our debt keeps growing. For example, take just one of our trading partners, China. The U.S. now owes China a trillion dollars that we borrowed to pay for all those imports that used to be made in America. So, as our government signs more and more of these agreements, it opens the door to more imports. That puts our national checkbook more out of balance and pushes America deeper in debt. We know that our families can't go on forever spending more than we earn, but we can do it for a while. So, if your neighbor is borrowing too much, his life may look pretty good from across the street. He has a nice house, new car, maybe a boat. But sooner or later, the bank gets nervous and cuts him off, or the bills just get too high to handle. Then it's goodbye boat, car, house, maybe even the marriage too. It's much the same for a country. If the U.S. keeps on spending more than it earns and borrowing to make up the difference, China, Japan, and the other countries we owe so much money to will eventually get nervous. They might stop lending to us or start charging us higher interest, which will slow the economy down. It might just drop gradually or it could crash. Some prominent economists say that we could be facing a catastrophe. Either way, there'll be less to spend at the shopping mall. Businesses will invest less and hire fewer people. What does this have to do with work in the building trades? A company that's putting up a bridge or casino or office building in Cleveland or Houston or Las Vegas needs people to hammer nails, weld steel, connect wires and sweat pipes on the spot, not in China. Aren't these jobs pretty safe? Not really. Remember, we all depend on the same economy. If other consumers and taxpayers' income doesn't rise, yours won't either. Twenty years ago, corporate CEOs and their Washington pals promoted these trade deals with the promise that no one would lose their jobs. Everyone will win from free trade, they promised. Don't worry. Then, workers who made clothing, shoes, and plastic toys lost their jobs. Then, workers who made cars and steel and appliances lost their jobs. Then, workers at call centers lost their jobs. Then, even computer programmers, engineers, and accountants lost their jobs. It's time to start worrying. George Bush is pushing to open up every sector of the economy, including construction, to foreign competition. Any restrictions that regulate the conditions of work in the U.S. could be outlawed as unfair trade practices. That could include worker protections like Davis-Bacon and project labor agreements that require union labor and prevailing wages. If the corporations get their way, contractors could bring in construction workers from anywhere and pay them only what they would make in their home countries. What they want is lower wages everywhere. Remember that growing gap between productivity and wages in the U.S.? Here's what happened in Canada after NAFTA. Just as in the U.S., productivity grew but wages stayed about the same. For Mexican workers, NAFTA has been an especially raw deal. The politicians and CEOs promised that it would create so many good jobs that people would not have to immigrate to the United States. Instead, wages were actually cut, and some two million Mexican farmers were driven off the land by big U.S. and Canadian agribusiness companies. With no jobs in the cities, 
even more Mexican workers were forced to risk their lives to cross the border in search of work. It's not Mexican or Chinese or Indian workers who are causing U.S. workers' problems. It's the wealthy and political elites who are using globalization to reap more profits by driving down wages and benefits. Republicans have been the major promoters of these deals. NAFTA was Ronald Reagan's brainchild. George Bush I negotiated it. And George W. Bush has worked overtime to expand it around the world. But Bill Clinton signed it and rammed it through Congress even though most Democrats in the House opposed it. So why has our government been doing this? Here's a big part of the answer. Big companies with American names have a huge influence in Washington. But more and more, these companies themselves say they aren't American. They're global. The CEO of Ford Motors recently said, we aren't even an American company, strictly speaking. We're global. When General Electric announced plans to produce most of its products outside the United States, the company's finance director proclaimed, we are a global company. Or even Chinese. The CEO of America's leading supplier of networking equipment for the Internet said, what we are trying to do is outline an entire strategy for becoming a Chinese company. Going global means that the Americans who run and own these companies have more loyalty to the rich and powerful people in other countries than to American workers. What should our political leaders be doing about it? First, they can stop making things worse. We should put all further agreements on hold until the government comes up with a plan to balance our trade and create high-wage jobs in America. The plan should begin by strengthening workers' rights, pass the Employee Free Choice Act, revise NAFTA and other trade deals to protect workers, not just corporate investors. Give every American access to high quality health care and reduce the burden on businesses producing in America. Eliminate tax breaks and other policies that encourage offshoring of U.S. jobs. And government should take the lead to spur public and private investment in energy efficient technology to create the high paying jobs of the future. We've heard the problem and the solutions. The next step is up to us. First we need more Americans to understand what's going on. We need to talk to our neighbors and co-workers, speak out at meetings and radio talk shows, write letters to the editor, let officials and candidates know you support fair trade not free trade. Polls show that once they hear the story, most Americans who work for a living oppose globalization. The millions of small and medium-sized businesses that produce here still depend on a prosperous America. And many members of Congress have come to understand that government should protect American living standards, not destroy them. For too long, Globalization has been used to undercut the future of America's working families. This is still a democracy. We start by educating ourselves, our families and friends, neighbors, fellow workers, and people who want our votes. Union members are an important source of support for politicians. When they ask for your vote, you need to ask them about their strategy for a high-wage future for American workers. If they don't have one, give them ours. And if after they're elected, they don't support it, find another candidate who will. What's at stake is our future 
and the futures of those that come after us. It's up to us to make this economy work for working people.